we begin in the Science Museum in London with a more sceptical examination of folk medicine. Treat Yourself is the latest in a series of exhibitions that examine the cultural context of medicine through a mixture of archive materials and modern artworks. Treat Yourself explores the persistence of antiquated theories in modern assumptions about illness and the body. The way into the exhibition is through a therapeutic tunnel, bathed in bright pink fluorescent light and hung with 12 CD players which collectively create a sound field of sustained chiming. This is Lydian Bells, the latest piece of ambient music by the artist Brian Eno. When I met Brian Eno, he was climbing up and down ladders, trying to restore the defective B in his chosen Lydian mode. The wrong mode, according to ancient and medieval theory, might unleash catastrophic waves of lust or aggression off Kensington High Street, rather than the desired lucid calm. The modal theory proposes that human beings themselves resonate at a frequency which is a harmonic of the rotational cycle of the sun. Being in effect incarnated music, we can be tuned or modulated by the various different modes. How seriously does he take all this? Well, I like modes. I've done a lot of records using modes as the sort of organising principle of them. The supposed therapeutic benefits I don't take seriously at all, really. But you've taken trouble to make sure it's as right as it can be in terms of tuning the vibrations of the colour, is that right? There are all sorts of theories about sound therapy, and they my opinion is that they're mostly crackpot theories, but I decided to use as many of them as I could in this piece as, as a sort of structure for making the piece on. And how often does it repeat, or has that yet to be determined? Is that a mathematical thing? Um, it's a mathematical thing, and probably it won't repeat in any of our lifetimes. Not exactly, anyway. But it never changes very much, either. So, so it's a sort of... It's rather like sitting by a river where nothing much changes, but nothing ever happens identically twice. And you've been making ambient works. Did you coin the word? I mean, you're certainly credited with the word ambient as a, as a description. You've been making such work for 25 years now. Does that develop? Is it a style of music that can be said to develop? Yeah, I did invent the word. And yes, I think it, it's a style of work that has very much to do with sound as, as a material. Um, and so therefore it explores a lot of the possibilities that have happened in the last... 50 years or so with recording studios and electronics and those possibilities keep um, growing you know there now with digital technologies there are a lot of things you can do with sound that you never could before and in fact this this piece uses tuning mechanisms that would have been very hard to um, operate a few years ago so um, yes it does develop in that sense it develops as a craft in that sense as an idea it develops um, in two directions. One is to the more blissful, in my opinion, and the other is to the more mediocre. <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of very bad ambient music around. There, there are certainly some whole labels where I think, how can you know whether you bought one of these before? Because you'd need to be listening quite a long time to be sure. <laughs> yes, it's a bit like Nouvelle Cuisine, where you say, wait, have I eaten yet? <laughs> The composer Paul Ruder's kind of phrase to describe one of the styles in which he writes orchestral music as activated silence. Is that a phrase that has resonance for you? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I suppose one of the things I want to do with, with this kind of music, paradoxically, is to try to make it feel that there is less going on. So I'm trying to reduce the sense of activity and of stimulus. So I'm trying to make something to to make it appear that there is less happening when, when you're experiencing that thing. And do you think it's partly because silence is now an endangered species or a rare commodity, that music has colonised so much of daily life that a sort mm -hmm. of music that counteracts music becomes positively valuable? Yeah, I think silence is like privacy, you know. It's one of those things that actually you have to pay a lot for now. <laughs> Both of those are very rare. When I went to see an installation of yours at the Riverside, I think about 15 years ago, I went and immediately curled up and went up, not quite to sleep, but quite close. I mean, most uh, artists would be very offended at that reaction. I take it you wouldn't. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be offended at all. No, I, I like that experience. I mean, I've experienced a lot of the work I like best sort of on the edge of consciousness. Um, for instance, the early Steve Reich works, which were very important for me, were works that have this same quality of being extremely repetitive but always slightly different from the moment before. 
And uh, I, I like that. That seems to me what a lot of natural processes are like as well. Watching things that, that change very slowly, but incessantly, is, is rather a wonderful thing to do for the mind, I think. The important message of ambient music was that music is something we now use in our lives. It's not a sort of given by the composer. Because of records and hi-fis and, uh, and the fact that we have control over music ourselves, we have to think about what we do with those controls. You know, where do we, where do we sit in relation to the music? What do we do in relation to it? Do we put everything down and listen, which is what orchestral music sort of demands? Or do we just get on with our lives and let it be part of the background? And, you know, when I started working on ambient music, part of that was a message to composers to start to think what does music mean when people control it so much more than, than they used to? So in a way, this is music that has accepted relegation to something you don't actually focus on directly, that accompanies rather than dominates. Well, it could be that. That's, part of, that's, that's one end of the spectrum. But the, the other thing is saying that the act of composition is now partly in the hands of the people who, who buy the records. You know, the, the way they choose to use the music is, is part of the composition of the music actually it's not the situation that you had with classical music where you bought a stereo record and sat down in your chair in the ideal position between two speakers and closed your eyes for an hour and a half people don't listen like that anymore they listen in lots of different ways and so you know i think composers have come to recognize that that they're making they're making something that is going to be used in ways that they can't control any longer How would you make a music that could be interrupted? A music that doesn't demand that you stay till the end, for example, so it's a steady state music. And really out of thinking about that, I started thinking of the idea of music not only as an aesthetic compositional problem, but as a design problem, as a thing that you made for people to inhabit. Um, and to make, you know, what's the best way for them to inhabit this? What, what will work best for them? To some people, bells are an absolutely English noise, but obviously every culture has had bells and uses them for a number of different purposes, many of them sacramental. Yeah, well, you're right that bells are very much an English phenomenon. Um, we have the best bell makers, and of the 6,000 churches that have peals of bells in them, 5,500 are in England, and another 350 of the remainder are in Scotland or Wales. So, so bells as church bells is really an English thing. And of course, they have smaller bells, have a long, long tradition of being involved with um, meditation and spirit cleansing and all those other things that I don't especially believe in. But nonetheless, I like the fact that it encouraged people to make these beautiful objects throughout history. Um, and also, of course, there, there's the Individual bells have very interesting histories. You know, some of the big bells were so difficult to make. It was sort of the technical equivalent of launching an Apollo moon rocket, making some of those very big bells. You know, the second biggest bell ever made was made in the seventh century in Korea. That's, I think that's amazing. It was 80,000 kilograms. A bell is almost, is such an individual creature that it's almost a piece of music in itself. It's like a bell is really a, a little composition. It's, it doesn't play a single note, it plays a chord. You know, when you tune a bell, you tune five notes, actually. It's a five-note chord. Um, and when I was making this piece, I, I was using a, a new synthesis technique to be able to create slightly unrealistic bells, actually. This is what I wanted to do, to imagine what a bell would be like made of a metal with slightly different properties or made of a metal with properties that we can't even imagine yet. So I've just done a whole record of pieces like that. Brian Eno talking about and more or less inside his sound installation Lydian Bells. 
The Treat Yourself show, of which Lydian Bells is part, consists of objects from the Wellcome Library and the Science Museum, alongside the work of 12 contemporary artists. There are curiosities like two anonymously donated medicine cabinets, which offer a snapshot of the health preoccupations of ordinary Londoners, and the Build a Better Burger game, all the action of a real fast food restaurant as marketed to children in the 1980s. The artwork includes Ellie Harrison's digital animation of her own eating habits and Julian Walker's Acts of Faith, a display of a thousand pills hand-carved into the likenesses of the organs they're supposed to treat. So, for instance, antacids have been whittled into little stomach shapes. 